Okay, we'll, we'll get started. Usually how it works is people kind of trickle in in the last couple of minutes here, and then I'll just continue to add them and mute them upon arrival so there, there won't be any interruption. Um, but feel free, everyone in the room, to unmute yourself if you want to, um, if you have any background noise. Um, we're going to try to make this uh, interactive so you will be able to ask questions. I'm just for the first part of this, what I would like to do is uh, keep it muted so we can get through some of the early information. And then um, as we go through, I'll open it back up uh, for questions and interaction and things like that. Um, so um, well, first of all, welcome and thank you guys for coming to the first mentor shop. We're going to be doing this program pretty much weekly um, if we can. Uh, every Friday, usually around this time, we might you know, switch up the times. We're just kind of playing with what, what time works for best for everybody. Uh, each of the mentor shops will focus on executives and leaders from around Wisconsin or you know, maybe whoever we end up with around the country, if that works out too. Uh, but talking about mentorship, leadership, uh, how, their career, their story, and it'll, each session will be around 30 to 45 minutes with Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna go through an introduction, I have some questions, and then again, we'll open it back up to the audience. So I um, wanna welcome Patrick O'Brien. Uh, just so everybody knows, he's actually my personal mentor, so this is, a, this is actually special for me too. But I'll just go through some of his history here, which is pretty, pretty accomplished. I'll start with presently, he is the chairman of the board and co-founder of Patina Solutions. Uh, before that, he was the CEO and uh, chair, or CEO of Paris Presents, and was named one of the fastest growing beauty companies in, in under one billion in sales. And previously to that, uh, he was at SC Johnson as the president of developed markets and global sales. And there's a lot more in the way. He was born in Milwaukee, he was a UW Madison grad. Uh, he was the 2016 Entrepreneur of the Year in Consumer Products of the Midwest. And I imagine there's another 30 minutes of lists I could probably run down around that, but I'll let him kind of take over and introduce himself from here if anything I missed. Sure. Um, I grew up in Milwaukee, 69th and Center. I'm a local kid. Went to Madison and went to SC Johnson and stayed 29 years. So from there, I uh, had a chance to do a startup, which was Patina Solutions, which is a staffing and consulting firm only using people with 20 years experience. It's based in Brookfield. Um, about $32 million and has been a good fun thing to do as a startup. But I'm not a services guy. I sell banded packs to Walmart and more consumer. So I became CEO of Paris Presents, which was a small beauty company with bath products and a couple of makeup brushes um, in the beauty capital of the world, Gurney, Illinois. And I was there from uh, 2012 until 2019 when uh, after our second exit, I spun out and now I'm doing board work. So I've had a chance to meet Jeremy. We've had some uh, great dialogues, a really good organization you have here. I was so impressed with what you're trying to do and how you're trying to make a difference in the community. So I'm glad to share some insights today and we can have it be interactive and fun and whatever we want to do, right? We're all here at home and I'm glad to try to help a little bit. So I'll, I'll start this out, Pat, by saying, you know, it, like you said, SC Johnson to Paris Presents to Patina Solutions are all different. You know, a lot of sometimes that isn't how people's naturally, natural trajections go. What are the pivotal points where you made a decision like that? I'm going to go into a completely different uh, product or a different company compared to what I was into before. How was that transition? What made you do something like that? Yeah. I had a great run at SC Johnson. I started as an assistant brand manager in 1981 and shout soil and stain remover. And, you know, I left there in 2010, um, having a chance to see in the world and run a good, good amount of it. And at the same time, uh, at age 51, you got to wonder, are you going to be a big company person all your life? You're going to do something on your own. You're going to try to spin out. And, uh, and that's what happened. And in the, in the course of, of those discussions, I really felt that it, it was going to be time to do something different. I had loved my independence that I had when I was in London working through the Europe business. And uh, very shortly after I, after I left SC Johnson, Mason Wells, which is a private equity firm in Milwaukee, 
had approached me about being on a board for this small beauty company. And uh, gosh, I was living in Kenosha. It's almost right down the street. And they were great people. And they were trying to figure out how they could grow this business. So I went on that board expecting to be on the board. And after about 15 months, they asked if I wanted to be CEO. And it really met my criteria, which was a chance to have some independence in a business large enough that I could bring in some new talent with a, with a thesis, which was uh, pretty exciting of how we could grow the business. And it had a small makeup brush business. And the idea there was people were buying makeup, but they weren't buying makeup brushes. And if we could convert, maybe the business could grow. And that's what we did. We brought in um, a lot of really good talented people and the business went from about $80 million to over 250 and uh, had a chance to hire great talent and grew that business. So that was fun. And that was a, a decision of having a chance to run a business more or less on your own, a uh, lot smaller than what I had been doing at SC Johnson, but a lot more independent. And it was a lot of fun. And then, as I said, after our second exit, I've, I've spun out to do some board work and to mentor Milwaukee leaders. How's that? Perfect. Um, I, you had told me something about Paris Presents that I found interesting. You know, when you took that over, um, obviously female makeup brushes, but there was a lot of male leadership. Um, and you told me one time that that had to change, like you had to have the people that were using it be uh, in positions of leadership and you made a full change on that. Tell me about that, yeah. you know, that process and how you went about it. We needed people. We were becoming more and more of a beauty company and less of a bath products company. And the beauty business when I first in there was about $20 million. And we could see it growing over $200 million. You need users, you need people to understand the category. So about 70% of our top 50 leadership team were non-users or men. I call them non-users. And I needed people who understood the products, how it was gonna work, what we're gonna be. And uh, when I left, we were at about 80% women and made that switch. And it really helped us get um, the right balance of understanding so we could be innovative. And that was a big change. Um, and I wanna uh, cut back to welcome everybody again, for those that joined late. We're gonna have a little session here where I ask some questions around mentorship and leadership. Um, again, this is Pat O'Brien, and then we'll go in to open it up where everybody will be unmuted and you can interact and ask questions along the way. And obviously there's a chat function if you want to type something in there right now. Uh, so my next question here, Pat, is really, I get asked this a lot, like what's your five-year plan? I never really have an answer, and maybe that's just a sign of me not you know, always creating something and, and really in the moment, but or maybe that's just what you should be doing is creating a five-year plan. What was your blueprint for success as you were kind of growing these businesses and even at SUJ? Did you yeah. plan that out in five years or how were you, how were you doing that? And we were more out, let's say three years with the, you know, the first year getting off to a good start. It, it comes down to a basic thought process of having a growth mindset. And you know, a growth mindset is critical to understand what can be versus where you are. And there's a book by the Stanford professor, Carol Druick, called Mindset, which I recommend. We gave it to many of our new hires. And it just talks about how you're gonna have a mindset which captures growth, how you're gonna be curious, how you're gonna look at, at business differently. And in the case of Paris Presents, as we started thinking this way, we just started to get momentum and started to get more and more growth. And it's an excellent book. You know, the first five, first five chapters are awesome. Probably after that, she stretched it out to make it a book. But the bottom line is, I think so much of our learning in business, so much of our learning in education is black and white, true, false. And really, business is different. Life is different, which is to try new things. So we never said, you know, this was our three-year three plan, four-year plan at Paris Presents to drive this amount of growth. We said, these are the right opportunities. Let's go get them, and we'll keep, it, keep the momentum going. Um, along the way, I imagine just like any company, there's, there's failure and then there's a learning curve going from, I mean, we'll just take Paris presents, or maybe you can kind of do this to any of the work you've had. Where are some of the failures you personally had, uh, who, and where did you kind of overcome that? And maybe even 
advice from other people that were mentors or peers and yeah. how that played into your decisions. You know, we, I was involved in a startup out of Madison called Bad Donkey. <laughs> and <laughs> it had some really interesting ideas and visions and uh, did not make it. And part of it was an inability to really get the core thesis right. It kept changing, kept modifying, and it had, had uh, communication advertising via texting. And, you know, what I learned from there was really understanding the thesis of how you want to grow, being able to adjust, but making sure that you're not all over the board. And, and uh, I could have... I could have spent more time in it. I was a board member. Uh, had I spent more time, perhaps it could have had a better outcome. But you know, my two learnings were, uh, number one, make sure that the plan to growth is, is real and you, everybody's on board and you understand it. And second, sometimes you gotta jump in faster than I did there. So um, it was a pretty good bomb. Uh, you know, I, I always feel like Milwaukee is, risk averse, you know, and it seems to be maybe part of the culture here. How do you approach risk? And what is your advice to people on the call here if you were mentoring them? Um, it's really important to understand realistically if you could win before you start, non-emotional, fact-based. Um, I mean, and you're going to take some risks such as a bad donkey and not everything's going to win, right? You got to accept that. But at the same time, uh, you can't get emotional and uh, to Google-eyed about opportunities. You've got to have a group that you can sit with and bounce the ideas back and forth. So I've, had, I've always had five or six people that I would call a kitchen cabinet or a personal board of advisors that we can talk about different things before I jump in and take the risk. And usually when I have failed, it's from not doing that work up front. And uh, as I've had more experience, I've learned to do that more and more, do the upfront work. Um, what about uh, maybe something around like lessons learned? Um, I think obviously right now in this moment of time, we're learning a lot of lessons around business operations, uh, pivoting and things like that. Were there moments where you learned a valuable lesson that when you pivoted or had to make you, and then you pivot in the past, you know, what could be applied to today where you've learned a lesson and maybe pivoted a company that people could take away? It's actually a really good assignment for people this week and next, right? Is to take a step back and you do deep business analysis about projects you're on or about opportunities. And most people, when you ask them, have never done that on their personal career or on their personal life. So if you look back, and it's a good project here, is spend some time when you're at home looking back on, on either your assignments in business or about even all the way back through school, where were you most successful and where were you not successful? And start to develop some traits that help you understand uh, where you do your best. Because really life is about you know, leveraging your strengths as well as doing a little bit of improvement on where you're not all that strong. So looking backwards is really important. And you start to get, you know, what can be, the conditions where you're going to do your best. And uh, so I, yeah, I did that, I did that um, before I went to Paris, which is I had a good understanding of where I did my best, where I didn't do my best. And as CEO of Paris, it was small enough that I could get to know everyone, but it, um, it wasn't too small that you couldn't bring in resources. It had independence, but also teamwork with the private equity firms. It wasn't a division manager fighting out for resources in big companies. And it, it was a way that you could work with a smaller group. So I think part of it is looking back and I, and I suggest everybody try to do this and understand where you did your best, what decisions along the way um, gave you good learning and move forward. And for those of you that just joined late, he wasn't the mayor of Paris. Paris presents as a company that he was the, the, the CEO of. So yep. just wanted to push that in there. You got it. Although you've probably been to Paris, so maybe you can give some advice there too. Um, what's some, you know, I think sometimes in companies we like will have meetings, tons of meetings and tons of pressure around something that maybe wasn't important. And in mentorship, sometimes we can dawn on those decisions. Like, was you know, is this going to impact my to sit my 
outcomes, it's gonna make my career. What's a time in your career that you thought was really important, but it turned out not to be that important? Yeah, it's an interesting point because my first boss told me this, when you drive home every day, ask yourself, did you work on the right things today? Did I spend time working on the right things today? And, um, and I think that's really important because you get derailed on non-essential things. So to me, I think what's really important is understand you know, your purpose and what you're working towards and make sure that the things that you do fo are focused on getting that done. And I can tell you, be that Paris Presents or Patina or S.C. Johnson, there are teams that you just, times when you just get derailed on non-A issues and you got to call time out and just say, hey, let's put this aside for a while or we'll come back to that later. I think it's really important to understand your purpose and what your key ways that you're going to grow. What about skills right now that uh, people maybe are growing their career or even growing their company? Uh, and let's say, you know, there's some people in the room, I know run their own thing here from the look some, some of the names. Uh, some other people that are in uh, the corporate track what are some of the skills that you've learned over time or people that should be aiming to grow themselves? Yeah. So we threw out the performance review at Paris presents classic stuff like planning an organization, uh, more traditional ways. And we built it around this growth mindset behaviors. And that included being proactive. I think being proactive tends to be people who are taking ownership, being curious and curiosity is a great trait for all of us to work on this week. Third is to be external and focus on what's happening in the external marketplace. Uh, next one was acceleration of growth. What are you doing to grow this company and grow the business and grow yourself? Um, next one was development of our team and our talent. Uh, we really emphasize both the what and the how, how you get things done as well as the what. Um, and of course, exceeding the targets. You gotta exceed the targets, right? That's kind of what it's all about. But we tried to build a skill set against this growth mindset. And the other one I'd add is I spent a lot of time on agility, which is uh, things are changing so much, you've got to be agile and you've got to make sure that you're flexible. Uh, as I look back over my time getting prepared for this, I realized that uh, about half my moves were laterals or in some case even a job level demotion, but they were to get more experience and more opportunity. Uh, sometimes we caught up on job levels and promotions and um, salary bonuses. All that comes with time. Uh, the better opportunity is take the best jobs you can get for learning, jobs that are important uh, to you and to the an organization, and keep building your skill set. And sometimes that's a lateral. Go for it. What about, let's just talk about success. I think some, you know, I always look at, people that want to leave Milwaukee sometimes, you know, and you know, that's a lot of my work is how do we keep people here? Um, the grass is always greener on the other side. And I, I think that's kind of human nature, right? Like we're always looking for the next thing. Was there a time in your career where you felt like you weren't successful and how did you rebound from that? Mm. Um, I've had a number of those. Once I found out I could be unsuccessful and make mistakes, it's a lot easier and it frees you. Um, I think there's been times on new products, I've been unsuccessful in launches and I realized that we just made some, maybe some strategic errors on the front end, which I can learn from and not do the next time. But on a personal basis, I've always said, it was really difficult living in London for four and a half fun years, good years, and then you got to re repatriate. That's, that repatriation is very tough. And uh, having never done it before, I didn't realize how challenging it can be. So uh, that was really difficult. Uh, and I think I processed the learning and really thought about ways that uh, I could take that learning and improve for the, for the next chapter. But I think going from an international assignment back in is tough. About 70% of the people leave within three years. Very difficult. Um, and I understood that. Um, a question from Steve Godfrey here in the chat. I, I think it's a pretty interesting one. Uh, what was your journey from employee to business owner like for you? It, what was the last part? 
uh, employee to business owner. What was that journey like for you? Yeah. Um, it's a lonely transition, right? <laughs> when you're owning the business, uh, it seems as if you know, you're out on your own. So you got to make sure you got a network. But uh, I realized along the way that uh, I like being a business owner. And what helped me in that transition is watching people, uh, especially a family company at SC Johnson. I saw the next generation, all the different uh, children start to take different pieces of the business and they were going through that same transition as well. So I learned a lot from watching leadership along that way. And um, it started to give us some, give me, give me some understanding of what it could be like, but it's never the same until you get in it. Um, I think the key is to listen a lot. And that was really what I try to do. Listen a lot, engage the team, and not try to do it all myself as a business owner. A uh, couple more questions until we open it up. One question I'm curious about, really isn't a mentorship question, but since you were in global and you work at you know, global sales, president of S.E. Johnson, then you're, you're in London, what was people's impressions of Milwaukee? How did you, did you sell it? Were you concerned with that at the time? I mean, is people trying to get people to live and stay here? I always find is when I was traveling internationally a lot for my old company, uh, people didn't know it existed really. You had to say you were from Chicago if you were international. So what, what, just kind of your thoughts on that. In the last five years, it's night and day. Uh, you know, five years ago, we were a northern suburb of Chicago. People saw it the way the city was positioned coming out of Laverne and Shirley and things such as that. And in the last five to seven years, there's really been a change. There's activity. There's a vibrant downtown. There's a vibrant uh, entrepreneurship community, which still can do better. So to me, I've seen a significant change as I travel around talking to people and uh, if you really think about it, more and more people are seeing the bigger cities are a hassle. It's, it's, it's a difficult to get around. But the benefits of Milwaukee is there's a lot to do. Um, you can make a difference here. There's a growing community. And there's a real sense that uh, it's a hidden gem. So let's just keep doing what we're doing. OK, I'm going to throw a curveball in here because I just always am interested in this question. This is like a philosophical question for everyone there. Um, why do you, th and this is, goes back to startups and how people are always creating new things. Why do you think humans are so confident in beliefs that can't be proven? Hmm. That, was, that was a curveball question. <laughs> Sorry. Say, it, say it one more time. Why do you think uh, humans are so confident in beliefs that can't be proven? Ah. I think we have a tendency to see the pot of gold Maybe that's an Irish analogy, but you know, we have a tendency to see the pot of gold and not always the road mines, land mines. And so we tend to start running against what's exciting and don't do the, the difficult diligence up front. So I never want us to lose our pot of gold chasing, never want us to lose our optimism. But at the same time, um, fast is, or slow is fast in the beginning and really making sure you understand the opportunity from many different angles is good, and then go for it. Um, I think one more question before I open it up, and I have a few more if, if we don't have any from the audience, but um, around what would you do if you're an employee right now and, and as people are going remote and, go, and people aren't working in the office, I imagine there's a lot of nervous bosses out there um, for better or for worse what would, advice would you give to employees right now um, around what they should do and how their interactions should be with their boss? It's a great question. You know, I've talked to six or seven CEOs in the last two weeks, um, bouncing how they're handling, what are different actions you can do. And uh, a couple of thoughts. One is just because you're remote doesn't mean you're not communicating. <laughs> and I suggest to everybody I talk to, uh, no matter where they are in an organization or a company, send your boss a note on Friday at one o'clock with some bullet points of here's what I'm working on and here's, what, here's what's uh, gonna happen next week. Communicate to them and do it via an, an email or a phone call. You do it at one o'clock because after, if it's late in the day, <laughs> they may be uh, pumpkining out. But the net is that you know, send them a note 
um, so that this person can understand, hey, here's what that person's working on. It gives them a sense of understanding and communication. Because on Monday, they're going to have to tell their management and their leadership, here's what's going on in my organization. So I, I, I think that's number one. Second is, I think it's good to call someone in your network every day just to touch base, someone you haven't talked to in a while. You know, you know reach out to someone, say, hey, how are things going, what you're doing? Uh, third is take breaks. I found myself on the computer at 7.30 because you're working at home. And you, you got to turn that thing off at some time. I don't care when you want to do it, but what you're finding home working, you're working all the time unless you've got kids that are chasing you to do stuff. Um, fourth, I think it's a good time to be curious. If you have time for analysis, look at the business in different ways and surprise people on some findings that you have found. Um, there's a lot of focus on data interpretation or data generation. I say focus on data interpretation. And you know, spend some time this week and next week being curious, trying to get some uncommon insights in the business. Um, and for those of you that are leading people, remember, they're feeling the same way. So touching base with everybody uh, once a day or twice a day when you can get to it, just asking them, hey, no business agenda, how are you holding up, is really important right now. Um, all of us are learning our way through how to do this massive remoteness. Some are more successful than others. That's how it's going to be. We're all going to learn on it. But I really come back to setting out at a one o'clock today. Tell people how you're doing. That's awesome. Um, so just for the more, there's a couple more people that joined. Uh, my name is Jeremy Foyet. I am the co-founder of Milwaukee. And our guest is Patrick O'Brien. Uh, the first part of this, we asked a few questions, dove into a little bit of his career, dove into a little bit of his mentorship advice. I'm going to open it up here and unmute everyone um, right now. So if you do have some noise, background noise, if you could mute back out. Some people are, okay, I'm gonna, I should probably mute everybody again. Okay, never mind, that didn't work. I'm going to mute everybody back again. Um, if you want to unmute and ask a question, uh, you can. Uh, I'll keep that open right now. So please click the unmute button, ask a question, or I will continue in a, in a little bit of interview. And I'll give a couple seconds for you to answer. Eve, I know you have a question. Uh, yeah, how, how did the two of you first meet? And, and Jeremy, I'm just curious about how the relationship with Pat has made a difference for you. Uh, you were asking, we met, uh, well, we met through the university club. So uh, I created a mentorship program in there for, for members uh, with the, I guess the, some in case newer members of the club or people, how do you get integrated? You know, a lot of my work is around integration and connection. And I felt that there was a, a missing piece in the university club to have, you know, there's just a wealth of knowledge in there. And how do we transfer that to people? So we were introduced through uh, the club, and we're, it's still rather new. I think we've known each other for, what, two months now, Pat? Is that pretty yeah. accurate? Uh, obviously, this we, we met in person uh, a couple times, but obviously through Zoom a little bit more. So we're still kind of on the way, but uh, I think the advice, I mean, so I'll just give you what a great person Pat, Pat is. I sent him everything Milwaukee has created <laughs> in email, and he actually read through all of it. So, I mean, that shows going, you know, going an extra mile and, and gave, giving advice back was really important. So, a little bit on our relationship. Um, anything you want to add to that, Pat? No, I think, it's, uh, I think it's important to try to pull people along as people pulled me. I had some great sponsors. I had a guy I worked for at SC Johnson more or less for 17 years. He called me one day and he said, I took a new job. I'm gonna be CEO of Nike. And I'm like, that's a great job. You get that phone call, you should take it. And, but he always had time for all of us. He always had time to push us, to help us along the way. And I learned a lot from that. So from my standpoint, um, uh, I don't need to do more new product launches, but if I can help some people along the way now, um, maybe I can uh, make a difference. Any other questions from the group here? Um, Sean, you have one? I saw you raise your hand there. Yeah, um, um, piggybacking off uh, the question you asked, uh, Patrick, about um, 
humans um innate uh well uh humans uh uh i forgot how you framed the question or, or exactly how you asked it verbatim but you basically asked them um why do um people uh tend to um <laughs> why, why do people the question i asked sean yeah so, oh, like why why are humans so confident in stuff they can't prove right, yeah. right. and i i guess my question the, the first question that popped in my mind um <clears throat> when you were asking that was and i wanted to uh, lob this to patrick do you think it's um, a matter of perspective that maybe one person or a group of people see something that um another group of people can't see because that's not their experiences absolutely yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, if you look at it from different lenses and different viewpoints, you can see opportunity. And so, when we went into Paris, um, about 65% of women were buying makeup every year, only 3% were buying a makeup brush. It was, wasn't a big deal to many people there. But if you saw that the gap between those two was a billion dollars. <laughs> So we knew if we could even get 10% of those people, we could get good growth. And because we were looking at, looking at the business from a way, how can we make this bigger? Because I like bigger business allowed us to oh, oh, I clicked the wrong button. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Keep going. Am I back on? Yep, you're back on, sorry. I, I gave the winning lottery numbers when we were out. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Uh, so, uh, you know, so it's a matter of what lens you look at it for. And we were in a growth lens and the people prior had not been as aggressive on that viewpoint. So I think part of it is what your goals are, part of it, who's you're with. Um, and sometimes you look at it from different angles. Thank you. Any other questions out there? I know we have, oh, Zach, um, you're muted, so I put it on mute, okay. Yeah, I was just um, curious as things have changed, it's kind of caused us to change our daily routines and habits and things we go about life right now. Um, if there's certain rituals or habits that you live by that you must do almost on a daily basis that set you up for success. I'm just yeah. curious if there's certain things that you do that you make sure are kind of like top priority every day. Um, I walk five to six miles every morning, rain or shine. I'm out, I'm into Veterans Park, I'm up to, uh, up the hill, and I do that every day. And that ritual, I hope I never have to stop it here, uh, because what it, what it does is it clears my mind. Uh, I talk to a lot of my buddies, I talk to a lot of people on different things, and I come back and I'm energized for the day. And the days I don't do that, uh, are not as good. And what I like about it is also, I'm not tied to a health club. I like health clubs. I can do that later in the day too, if I want to. But I think that daily walk is really, really important. Second is, I talk about everybody on my contact list once a week. I have favorites, I should say, right? I probably have 18, 19 people in the favorites and I just keep working it. And everybody wants to hear it right now, right? My dad is 89 out in Wauwatosa. He's going nowhere. Uh, he loves the phone call. So, you know, I try to do the walk, I try to touch base with the people, and I found that works, right? Um, eating a lot too much ice cream, it's not a ritual, but it's, it's getting me through this week. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things I've done, I, so I used to work out of home for my whole career, except for Milwaukee, it was the first time I never worked out of home. Um, I remember, one of the things I remember doing as, as a ritual was always put on my shoes in the morning. And it just felt like you were ready for the day. And it's something so simple. But if you, if you don't have your shoes on, it doesn't feel like you're always ready for something. But there's one thing I do now that I'm back at home working again is right in the morning when I'm ready for the day is put on my shoes like I was going somewhere. Even if I'm not going anywhere, which I haven't been. Um, any other questions? Not that you all came here for advice from Jeremy. <laughs> but that, that, is, that was my advice. Okay, so um, if anybody has anything, I see there's, there's some activity in the chat. Um, I have some closing 
shot or parting shots, kind of, if you want to close the discussion out here. Um, what are some takeaways? You know, we had a conversation today, Pat. What are some things you want people to take away from this conversation? If it was like one or two things. Um, I started on 69th and Center, right by Enders Park. Worked at Kohl's food stores from 16 all my way through college. And uh, uh, so I understand it's a long journey. So I hope that people understand from what we're talking about here is through hard work, you can do a lot. Uh, through hard work and taking some risk and learning from the failures, you know, it, it can work out okay. So that was number one. Number two is we all have successes and failures. We always want to talk about the successes. Your questions tend to talk about with good balance, which was great. But, you know, we're going to have failures along the way. And this book, this book Mindset, um, talks about that, right? When you first started playing tennis, you are uh, making a lot of mistakes, but it's fun and you're laughing. We get to business, we think we're going to be perfect. So, you know, life is a matter of successes and failures and learnings along the way. So I hope they took away that, number two. And number three, you know, having a growth mindset is really key because you get to do great things. You get to build business, you get to hire people, you get to develop people and really thinking of how can I do it differently and how can I grow this business? So I hope those are helpful. Any other speakers or books that you recommend and help you along the way that you want to give to people? Um, in the, the last book, again, if everybody didn't hear that, was Growth Mindset. I, I think Joe, you know, Joe Sweeney wrote a book, Networking is a Contact Sport. Um, he's a Milwaukee guy. It's a good book. Um, Mindset is the second one. Um, there's a book called Return of the Prodigal Son. All of us have have had ups and downs, and I think it's a good balanced book. And then there's a great one, which we gave out as well at Paris. A guy named Jude Rake wrote a book called The Bridge to Growth. And that talks about growth in business as well as on your team. Um, that's a really good book. So those are my top thoughts for you on that. Thank you. And then my final question that I'm going to ask everybody on here, what do you want to achieve the rest of the year personally? Uh, well, we want to stay safe, right? That's, that's pretty critical right now. And, um, uh, but I would say between now and the end of the year, I'm, I'm building a practice on boards and I want to make sure that I can learn how to do that successfully and, and contribute. Uh, and third, I want to continue to give back in different ways. So I think if at the end of the year, I've done some board work successfully, I've had a chance to help some people um, accelerate their careers better um, and I stayed safe, I think that's a win. Excellent. If there are no more questions, Sean, do you have another question? Awesome. Yeah, um, I, want, I wanted to get his opinion on that because you spoke about successes and failures along the way. Um, I saw something posted on, online the other day that really caught my attention. I wanted, your, I wanted you to uh, um, weigh in on it. It said, uh, it was a quote that said, winners quit, they just know when to quit. What do you think about that? What was your question again, John? It said, I saw something, I saw something posted online um, the other day, because you spoke about successes and failures. Yep. Um, and I, I, I just wanted your opinion about this quote. It said, because it really caught my attention. Um, it said, winners quit, they just know when to quit. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting quote, isn't it? Right, which is, I always say quit when you're ahead. Uh, I do believe that there's a life cycle and that uh, you know, doing actions and being successful at it with time, you'll start, you'll tend to burn out a little bit towards the end. And I do think it's important to know when to go. Um, I spent 29 years at SC Johnson, so I'm not an example of someone who who went a lot, right? But I had a great run there. But I think understanding every year where you're at what's your chance to win, what's your chance to succeed, what you're struggling with is really important. And because usually there's momentum that hits on business and there's life cycles. So I like that quote. I think there's some truth to it. Thank you. Excellent. Anyone else or we can close up and then um, we'll send out, if you, we'll send out a, just a little recap. This is being recorded. If you want to, if somebody that came in late want to see it again, we will send this out in the link. But we'll also send out uh, an email of um, information that we've taken away from it. So 
unless there's anything else, I think we can let you go, Pat, and have a great day and a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the day. Take care. Okay.